Do you believe that the mind is, in principle, computable, implying that it could be emulated on other substrates in the future? On other substrates, like silicon, I think he's talking about. As far as look, the mind is organized matter. It's organized in a particular way, which we don't understand, but uh, we don't understand much about B communication. Uh, it, and uh, there's no reason, we don't know of any physical reason to believe that the particular components of that organized matter are critical for its operation. It appears to be something about the way it's organized. That's as far as we yeah. know, so therefore it could be uh, uh, emulated, presumably, in some other substances. Yeah, I mean, as a physicist, I mean, it's, it, 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 we are a computing machine of some sort. Of some and it happens to be, has a, ha, we happen to use a certain system for storing and, and, and reproducing, whether it's genetic or, or electrical. It's hard to imagine that any other system wouldn't, that if we were able to reproduce all that information, we wouldn't get the same, the same person. But it's one of those cases, as you said before, where you really have to be humble, because so little is understood about it. And the major question, uh, what's, what is the puppeteer doing? Yeah. That one we don't even know how to address. This, this emerging notion that many of our conscious decisions are really not conscious. Maybe you want to elaborate on that. Well, there's increasing, exper there's some experimental evidence by now that when you undertake a voluntary action, like say picking this up, uh, uh, very briefly before you are conscious of making the decision, the parts of your brain that are organizing the action are already active which means that the decision is made pre-consciously uh, and then reaches consciousness at some point. Now, most of our decisions never reach consciousness. Uh, we're doing all kinds of things all the time and totally unaware of them. Uh, and parts of uh, the way our, uh, we, we have two brains, remember. Uh, there's this one and there's this one, sometimes called the gut brain, the enteric nervous system, which is a real nervous system, rich in neurons, has it suffers Alzheimer's, uh, it's very similar to this one. And we have the slightest consciousness about what it's doing. It's work Unless you get a stomach ache, then you know it's not working properly. <laughs> but uh, with regard to language, uh, unfortunately there has been no investigation, serious investigation of the question, though it could be investigated. So we're left at the moment with introspection. That's not a good state, but try it. <laughs> when, when you introspect about your thinking and language, I think what you find is that the expressions you articulate to yourself, you know, come almost instantaneously, indicating that there was pre-conscious organization of the thought that is sometimes reaching consciousness and often is not. And I suspect that when these topics begin to be investigated, which is not impossible, uh, that's what we're going to discover. That most, the, this mystery of what the puppeteer is doing is probably pre-conscious. Uh, we will not get access to it through conscious introspection, but only in indirect ways, the way we, fig we learn what the enteric nervous system is doing. Uh, that's a, a guess about what will be discovered if these topics are ever uh, investigated seriously. Uh, one of the reasons they're not investigated is because of the assumption in modern philosophy psychology that consciousness is the hard problem. I don't think that's true. I suspect consciousness is a problem that we know how to address. You know, you can find the mechanisms involved in consciousness. Hmm. You'll learn a lot about it. Pre-conscious decisioning uh, choices I suspect is a much deeper problem. Okay, well, that, this is interesting. Because, I mean, we're both we're asked to, to, to speculate on things about the future, for which we really, as we should emphasize, about a system that we don't understand much of now. But in that spirit, and following up on this idea that maybe we could, we could um, that, that the brain is a material uh, entity and, and therefore might be uh, um, reproduced elsewhere, uh, Bishop has asked, do you think that AI, and this is a really interesting question, I think, do you think that AI will have the same snowflake language apparatus 
or quick evolutionary moments in regards to creativity and language, namely, assuming AI becomes subconscious, will it, it, would you imagine it would have the same kind of um, language development? It's a really speculative question, but it's an interesting one, it seems to me. Well, first of all, I should be a little cautious about AI. What exactly is it? Uh, there's uh, two variants of AI. One is roughly you know, science and engineering. I mean, it's a rough distinction. Uh, there's the kind of AI which is trying to construct devices that are useful, you know, self-driving cars, yeah. uh, robots that can clean your house, uh, things like that. That's fine, you know. It's not really contributing, except very indirectly, to the understanding of how uh, cognitive systems, intelligent systems work. It's doing things that are useful, which is fine. It's like building a big, bigger bulldozer, it's great. There's another kind of AI, which is, which is pure science, which is trying to discover the nature of what is going on when a nematode decides to turn to the left or when I decide to pick this up. But that's the same as, it's called, it might be called AI if you like, but it's the same as yeah. uh, uh, just science, cognitive science. What will happen if the, I think the question is asking, what if robots are designed which have the same properties, the, the mechanisms that we will come to understand are essential for, com for consciousness? Will they be conscious? Now, we can already ask that question about dogs. I mean, are they conscious? In fact, you can ask that question about me. You know you're conscious. Do you know that I'm conscious? No, just because I tell you I am. That doesn't mean anything. The <laughs> robot could too. Uh, we There's the Turing test, which it turns out to be not a very good test after all. Well, the Turing test is kind of interesting. Turing himself was a, a very brilliant mathematician and scientist. He understood that the test didn't amount to much. The history of the Turing test is kind of intriguing. This is based on an eight-page paper around 1950 yeah. uh, called uh, Can Machines Think or something. Turing in that paper says the question whether machines can think is too meaningless to deserve discussion. And uh, he's right. Asking whether machines can think is like asking whether submarines swim. If you want to call that swimming, it's swimming. Uh, it's, uh, and in fact, like, it takes a, uh, you know, it takes a, the airplanes fly. In English, they fly. In Hebrew, they glide. Uh, do people fly? In Japanese, when they're jumping, they fly. In English, they don't. Uh, these are terminological questions. Uh, what we can do, and Turing, uh, Turing, he did suggest this imitation game, but it is not, as he pointed out, an answer to the question whether machines think, because it's not a serious question. The notion thinking isn't well enough defined, so you can ask whether it's being achieved by some device. Now, it's kind of striking that if you go back to the 17th century, the same questions were asked but as scientific questions. So go back to Descartes, who observed, as far as we know correctly, that this creative aspect of language use is a unique human capacity. Well, that immediately led to uh, experimental proposals. Uh, de Cordemois, one of the minor Cartesians, outlined tests that you could use, a series of experiments that you could use if there was another creature who looked like you and you wanted to find out if he had this capacity. And he pointed out, like a scientist, that if the creature passes all the tests you can think of, then it would be reasonable to assume that he has the capacity. It doesn't prove it, but you don't prove things in science. But that was a serious version of the Turing test. It was about rea something real, alleged, uh, the, namely a capacity that you're, tr it's kind of, you're trying to test for. It's kind of like a litmus test you know, for acidity. There's something real, you're trying to find out whether some object has it. That's very different from the Turing test. In fact, in many ways, I think there's been kind of intellectual regression from the 17th century to today, uh, replacing the serious tests for about 
reality, litmus tests for a particular capacity by a test that's basically like answering the question whether submarines swim. Doesn't mean Let, much more than that. Let's follow up on that a little because, the, the, you know, the, you talked earlier this evening about the idea that maybe things, the, 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 whatever it was that, that initiated the possibility of language had to be, in a sense, because of the laws of nature. The thing that I, I would be interesting to me is whether, therefore, there is a unique co set of cognitive processes. And so it would be interesting if one had machines to think to see if they think differently. I think that would be a fascinating uh, question. Certainly. We know that there are some that are different. So, for example, uh, uh, an automated procedure for, uh, say, determining whether a paper in the American Mathematical Society gives a real proof. If you look at things that are called proofs, I mean, there are lots of intuition and you know, appeal to what people know and so on. Yeah. You try to formalize it and fill them in, the details, it's pretty hard, but yeah. it sometimes turn out to be very hard. But you can think of automated ways of doing that, which are not the ways we do it. And as I've said in the stage before, we know that computers think, at least right now, think differently because they well, use they energy in a very vastly different well, way. Well, they do all kinds of things that we can't do. But the and, and they also do it much, in some sense, more, much more inefficiently in terms of energy consumption. Yeah, but so, do, so, do, so do cars. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm.